Welcome to Continuous Stream. Today, Part 4, Chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, The Conclusion of Kells, The Gospel of Columba, a novel by Amy Kreider. Part 4, read by Jeff Breitman, Baird Brucher, and Lindsay Summers. Part 4, Chapter 8 The Reason I can hardly write this, but I must. The horror has come, and now the wind brings fear. We all glance to the water, looking for the broad sails, for the shields burning in the sun. The deep peace of the running wave is shattered. We are shattered. I was with the boys, tending the vegetable garden, when one of them shouted, pointing behind me, and we all turned. Six longboats knifed the water, pointing at our beach like daggers, bringing a stench of death. My first thought was to protect the boys. Run to the church and stay there. I grabbed their hands and pulled them away. What are they? What does this mean? They asked. They are raiders. I wanted to say as little as possible. Let us fight, they said. We are men of God, I told them. Then we should not hide. I rushed them into the church under the care of Nithard, ordering them to obey me. The bell rang, loud and fast. The monks were assembling outside the church. I ran to Conita, who had just come outside. We need the book, I shouted. I raced into the house, into the scriptorium. Connacht ran after me. No, Kella. Don't. The Cairo page was laid out on the desk, the letters just outlined. I slipped it out from under the weights and held it over my head. Connacht stared in astonishment. For a moment we paused, a heavy moment, as outside the bell clanged and a chant rose from the monks. Connacht raised his hand toward the page, opening his mouth, his body tense with the urge to action. His face was baffled, then winced in pain, then defeated. His poised body sagged and he leaned against the desk, his breath draining away. No, he whispered. It is all we have, I said. We had no weapons, only the word of God. I ran back outside, where the hundred monks had formed a chorus, lined up four abreast in the road, their voices deep and powerful, chanting the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I took my place at their head to hold up the Cairo page in front. We marched chanting toward the beach to confront the white devils with prayer. The chant swelled, beautiful, calming us with the power of love. And so we marched to the beach, where the heathen monsters were pulling their boats ashore. They looked at us wonderingly as we assembled before them and chanted, our voices growing louder filling the air with everything we stood for, everything we had, with majesty, with mystery, echoing out courage that came from God. The monsters stood back, holding the swords at their sides, listening with confusion. I held up the page as high as I could. Connacht has stood beside me, and I heard his voice tremble. One of the devils took a step toward us. Another barked at him. He turned toward his chief and gestured in dismissal. He took another step and raised his sword. They could have simply walked past us to steal what they wanted, our silver plate and crosses. They could have done as they pleased and left us unharmed. But that was not their nature. The one devil looked confused and angry as he raised his sword above his head. We sang. The other monsters watched him. They seemed afraid waiting for him to do something, as if they thought we might have some trick, some way to attack them, though they could see we didn't have the means. They did not believe their eyes, that a hundred defenseless monks would stand before them only praying. They believed other men were like them, cruel and violent, and they had no way to understand men of peace. The devil took another step. We chanted, Yea, though in the valley of the shadow of death. Reuben stood at the end of the line. It seemed I could hear his voice above the rest. In a flashing moment, I remembered all my time with him. Our journey on sea and land, 
his humor and his wisdom. In a moment, I heard everything he had ever said to me. Ah, quiet at last. The salmon must be for some waiting monk on shore. Take care of the old man. The sword flashed like a memory. It burned in the sun as it came down faster than lightning. Reuben raised his chin to meet it, his neck stretched. Yea, though in the valley of the shadow of death. His voice suddenly loud, and it was not my imagination. I could hear him. And then his neck was split, and his voice stopped. The sight of blood excited the rest of the stinking mob, like a school of sharks. They all jumped, roused to their violent urge at once, the spell of our chant broken. They rushed at us. Who among us would run away? Who would turn first? The first to move was Marcus, but he didn't run. Just as they sprang, he stepped forward and grabbed the one who killed Reuben. Reuben was Marcus's Amkara. He grabbed the devil by the hair and punched him in the throat. The devil fell on him, but as the attackers ran at us, their chief tripped and his sword went into Reuben's killer. The chief leapt back up, laughing. Marcus returned to his place, his arm bleeding. We chanted still, our voices as loud as the devil's roar, answering their guttural heathen shouts with the peace of angels' music. They were as frenzied as we were calm, and I, I wanted to run. But I could not be the first, and no one else ran. I waved the page, my voice growing hoarse with fear. Blood flew up like rain. I cannot describe the carnage. I long to forget. I will not describe the bloody defilement and cruelty launched at us. As our voices dimmed, and one by one our brothers fell. When more than half of us were down, the beasts had their fill. They seemed to suddenly remember what they were there for, and ran roaring up the path to the house and the church. I thought of the boys I'd tried to keep safe. Had I made a horrible mistake? The church was what they wanted for the silver. Smoke rose in the air. Still, we chanted. Behind me, Gormgul put his arms around my waist so that I could hold him up. Marcus sank to his knees, inspiring us all to kneel among the dead, chanting. The beasts returned, carrying their burden of loot. I thought of the burden of silver we carried across Francia. That is the fate of wealth, to cause death and chaos. The beasts threw the silver onto the boats and pushed off. As they moved into the water, one of them, who looked young and who seemed perhaps to have some human feeling, stood up in the boat and raised his sword in a salute to us as they rowed away. They were gone. We stopped chanting. Karnaktash stood before us as we remained kneeling amid the butchery. First, look for survivors, he said. We worked among the fallen to determine who was dead. Marcus was injured, a gash on his arm, and a few others had injuries they could survive if they did not become infected. Sixty-eight monks were dead. We laid them on the beach. It had been known as the Bay of the Dead already, because dead kings landed there for burial. Now we would call it Martyr's Bay. As we marched back up to the monastery to assess the damage, a high chant rose above us. Old Nithar and the boys were at the top of Donai, singing. We learned they had thrown all the silver out of the church and escaped up the hill. Inside, the altar was broken, and candles scattered across the floor, all the windows broken. Otherwise, the church was unharmed. The house was smoldering, partially burnt, but the chest with the book pages was untouched. Gormgal sank to his knees in front of the bookcase and pressed his forehead against it. I laid the Cairo page back on the desk. Connachtuck came up to me and put his arms around me. We held each other in exhaustion. We didn't have forty shovels, so we took turns, and those who weren't digging brought more bodies, swept up the broken glass in the church, and started to repair the house. Men brought wood from Mull. 
and monks came from Tyree to help. The boys gathered moss to dress the wounds of the injured, and perhaps it was a small miracle that no one of the survivors' wounds was mortal, but I was in no mood to believe in miracles. To dig sixty graves is hard work, and we worked until we were senseless, until the sight of the gore didn't sicken us, but only seemed an unreal nightmare, in which we were the ghosts. We reassembled the bodies of those who were in pieces, gently, as a mother cares for her child's broken doll. And then the child has died, and the doll is carefully wrapped and laid in the grave. The gore was too much. These were only dolls. They could not be men. In the evening, a warm rain fell through the still, windless air, the rustle of the drops the only sound other than the shifting of the sandy earth. We had not eaten or drunk, and we rubbed the moisture over our lips with dirty hands. We were all filthy like hermits, muddy and matted and blood-spattered, as if we had been punishing ourselves. And we wanted to punish ourselves. I wondered if somehow I had brought this here. Had I been near their region in Frisia, I had seen where they go. I had come from Lindisfarne, their first raid. Perhaps somehow they followed me. Perhaps they had always been watching me. Perhaps I had brought a curse from my travels. Perhaps I was evil. Nithard stopped digging and leaned on his shovel. His face was white and sweating. He sank to his knees and looked peculiar. I hurried to his side. He raised his arms and I held him, his head against my waist. Rest, I said. Yes, this is my rest now. He slumped and I eased him onto his back. He was sweating profusely, and his face turned red, then white again. His breath was strangled in his throat. He died. I did not bury him in the grave he had been digging. I would not do that. I dug his grave, and the shock wore off me. No longer senseless, I dug with rage and hatred in my hands, in my shoulders, in my legs. My empty stomach was tight with rage. As it was midsummer, the sun didn't set until late. When it was dark, we held a mass and an all-night vigil. Though exhausted, we were wide awake. The chant of the remaining monks was quieter from the missing voices and thin with choking tears. Finally, late in the morning, we were done with the burials. Connachta had us eat some bread and cheese, which was like dust in our mouths. The sky was gloomy and grey, but it was warm and the muggy heat oppressive. I walked across the island to Columbus Bay. How empty the island seemed. No monks in the gardens, none tending the cattle. I went down to the pebble beach, where the monks often piled rocks into mounds, a rock to represent every sin. I began to make a pile, but soon I simply picked up the stones and threw them into the grey sea. We could have had piles of rocks as weapons. We could have fought. The exercise only increased my fury. I picked up a red stone like a heart and threw it as far as I could. The humid clouds began to resolve into rain. As the drops fell, the colors of the pebbles came out, and the grey beach took on hues of green, yellow, red, orange, purple, and white. I thought of all the monks who wouldn't see this, who wouldn't see stained glass or paintings again, who wouldn't see the book completed. The book that didn't save them. Marcus found me there and watched me throw the stones. Why didn't we fight? I asked him. Why didn't we try? Why did we respond the way we did? You started to. We don't have weapons, but we have pruning shears, we have plowshares, we could have done something rather than be slaughtered like calves. Marcus took a deep breath and pulled his cowl over his head against the rain, shadowing his face. His eyes glowed, hard in anger like mine. He weighed his words. We didn't fight because we are monks. And that is not what monks do. We are men. Did we give up everything, our very manhood? Perhaps. I dropped the stone in my hand, brought my fist to my chest. I could be a chief. I could lead an army against such monsters. Marcus folded his arms and held himself. He spoke quietly. That will not save the world. 
And how did we save the world yesterday? By staying who we are, to the end. Sobs came over me. Sobs of both rage and confusion. Marcus put his arms around me and I felt his body quiver with his own tears. Days passed. We repaired the house and put skins over the church windows. Connachtach, who had been weakening before the raid, was able to respond with some renewed energy afterward. We conferred about what to do, and I urged the brothers to invite an army to live with us, but that was rejected. Instead, we decided to move. Our island, so remote, was too easy for the raiders to attack by ship. We would move to Hibernia, inland, and we would build a monastery of stone with a tower to withdraw to if attacked. I went along with this, but my desire to respond more aggressively was frustrated, and there was more. I saw lines added to the book, to the Cairo page. And as the book appeared like a vision through the dawn, I couldn't ignore my doubts any longer. My rage at the invaders was matched by another anger. One day, in the scriptorium, alone with Connachta, I could no longer contain myself. Of what use is this book, this great book? Was it not to protect us? I should have known better. I saw the Bible of St. Boniface. I saw the scar that cleaved his cover and his head. Where is the power of the Holy Word? Where is the power of God in our work? What is the meaning of our labor? It is all for nothing. Why didn't we forge weapons, swords and shields instead of grinding paint and straining ink? What is this for? Kanaktuk took in my questions. His face was gaunt and slightly yellow, the grizzle of his beard coming in white. His neck was thin and his jaw sharp, the skin close to the bone. His gaze was humble as he accepted my anger and despair. He clasped his hands and turned his gaze upward, eyes shining with the light of someone close to death. That moment, in his look so holy and shining, I saw how soon he would join our late brothers. I was gripped with remorse and sadness, but also a whisper of hope that if anyone could tell me the purpose of our work, our days of prayer, or our very lives, it was he. He spoke just above a whisper, his voice like a wisp of smoke, his words penetrating the air like incense. You know, how I had longed since I came here, since even before then to create this great book. But I was told over and over it was only my pride that inspired me. And that was true. It was only when I forsook my pride that I suddenly had the opportunity. Like an unexpected gift. I knew I must treasure it and let go of my frenzied emotions, my very self, to do this work. And I knew we must do it. When Darek came and told us of the attack on Lindisfarne, I knew one day the raiders would come to us. Some think the world is coming to an end. It is the final judgment. I don't know about that. Perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. There have been three ages. The age of the Old Testament, the age of our Lord, and this final age as we await his return. I think, though, that perhaps the world is not ending, but that some change is happening and will happen. There are places that don't know our Lord. There are people who live and don't know. And there are those who attack us like wild beasts. And as there are other places in the world, there are other times, past and future. I thought that there might be a future as foreign to us as the pharaohs of Egypt, as foreign to us even as these alien monsters who came and took the lives of our brethren only for a little silver and worldly gain so easily lost. And I thought this. Only one thing, that whatever the world holds, and whatever the future holds, people would know we are here, and we love, that we live the word of Christ, that we made this book to last forever only because we love, we love each other, we love our fellow brothers and our fellow man, and we love God. 
And this love is incarnate in our work. It is only out of love that any great work is done. And if it is only a humble thing that we labor over, hour after hour, that is still something. Something that tells the world of our existence, our sacrifice. We have left behind families and given up our birthright. We will not have wives and children. But it is not because we don't know what love is. We know it keenly. And all the love we have sacrificed we gain back in our brothers and in our prayer. The book is for all those we have loved. For our brethren who died and live in our hearts. And of our Christ who lives forever. This book will last and tell this to the world. Our love allows us to do this work. And above all else, we love better because we do it. That is the final reason. That our labor makes us love better. When Kanaktak finished, I wiped the tears from my eyes. I rose and kissed his cheek. And I asked him to give me my final vows to stay on as a monk. Part 4, Chapter 9 A Proposal Una fetched the water from the kitchen well. Then, in a small, rebellious act, she took the long way around and stepped into the garden. White jasmine bloomed and scented the air among dark, glossy leaves. She moved slowly between the manicured trees, noticing everything. A marble fountain sprayed in the center of a bed of tulips, scarlet streaked with white and purple. The flame-like petals were wild in the carefully ordered garden. Jang sat alone on a bench on the other side of the fountain. She started to back away, but he beckoned for her to approach. She took small steps forward and set down her jug. I'm glad you're here, Jang said in his sing-song accent, so at odds with the guttural language. Una knelt and folded her hands in front of her legs. I asked you a question the other day, but you didn't get to ask me anything, Jang said. She gazed up. Do all your people have eyes like yours? We are a different sort. Your eyes are like the sky. Ours are like the earth. What is your land like? Green. Vast. There are plains and beautiful lonely mountains veiled in mist. Tranquil gardens. Farms where the grain grows in water. Cities where all is in order and harmony. There are no cities or towns where I'm from in Scotia. Only farms and monasteries and some forts. Are there monasteries in your land? Oh, yes. Beautiful monasteries. We pray to Buddha. She raised her eyes. I've seen you pray. I liked watching you. Because you seemed so content. That is the goal of our prayer. Only to be at peace and content. What do you say? You weren't speaking when I saw you. We chant sometimes and we say... However innumerable sentient beings are, I vow to save them. However inexhaustible the defilements are, I vow to extinguish them. However immeasurable the dharmas are, I vow to master them. However incomparable enlightenment is, I vow to attain it. But mostly, my prayer is my breath. We breathe slowly, counting. And in that stillness is our prayer. I used to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. She shrugged. Now I pray to Allah. I pray what they tell me to pray. You no longer seek anything in prayer? I do not exist. I am an echo. He smiled. That is wonderful. 
She had been too long, and she rose. He bowed his head. When she had poured the water into the cauldron in the kitchen, Rosa came up from behind her and boxed her on the ear. I saw you dawdling with that man. You are an evil devil, wasting time and disturbing the men. You don't belong in the garden. You keep your place and don't put on airs. You are proud. That's what your sin is. Evil worshipper of whores. She pinched Una's wrist and shoved her away. Una was alone in the small hallway between the kitchen and the men's dining room, scrubbing the tile floor. Her knees hurt where they grazed the tiles, but it was cool in the shaded passage. She heard footsteps approaching, but didn't pay attention until a man cleared his throat. She looked up. Ali was standing in the archway. Quickly, she wiped her hands on her skirt and stood up, bowing and keeping her gaze down. I have a message for you. Where can we talk alone? He asked. We are alone right here. He stepped closer to her, the bucket between them. They could hear faint voices coming from the kitchen. The thick walls muffled the sound. You have a change of fortune, he whispered. I have come to ask for your hand in marriage. Jang is very impressed with you. He seeks to marry you. Una kept her gaze on the foamy water in the bucket. I cannot choose my fate. I am owned. Yes, permission is required. Jang is an honored guest, but still a prisoner. He has not the status of a citizen. It would be allowed. Think and accept it. He esteems you. You would have a little status, a different life in a new land. He is being sent back to his country. He wishes to take you with him. Una looked up and saw this future. To be able to come and go, she could learn about the world, learn about yet another strange new place, as a free woman. What was the East like? They would go there. He said it was green and mountainous, no more of this dusty, dry desert that turned everything its tan color. She looked at the ceiling and saw the blue sky of other lands. Her heart began to pound. And she would be known, then. No longer would she be a blank space. She would be known. And then they would let her visit her daughter. To be married is a better thing than to be alone, he said. Startled, she looked up. The heavy brick ceiling was there. The floor that would never be clean of dust was beneath her feet. She looked from wall to wall. The massive walls, so close to her. She looked from ceiling to floor to wall, and there was nothing else to see. He blocked her view through the archway. Behind her, pots clattered in the kitchen. She looked into his bright face and showed him a face that showed nothing. I have a living husband. I cannot accept. His face slowly dimmed. He backed away. Of course, he said, and bowed low to her before exiting the hall. She fell to her knees and scrubbed. Part 4. Chapter 10. Gladium and Gaudium. I worked at scribing the book as Father Connachtuck became weaker. He tried to perform his duties, but he was wasting away, and we all knew but didn't speak of it. I was copying Matthew when I came to a verse that deeply troubled me. The line is, I come not to send peace, but with a sword. Our Christ could have meant several things, perhaps the sword of division between unbelievers and the faithful, perhaps the sword of justice. But I was troubled. We had had enough of swords and enough bloodshed. I went to Abbot Connachta after Prime to unburden myself. He stood when I entered, and I begged him to lie back on the pallet beside his desk. He was in his office daily, but sometimes had to lie down, and a pallet had been provided. 
The green light from the window fell on his hollow face. He looked old beyond his years, but his eyes were bright and sharp. I told him my anxiety over what I had to write. He raised himself up slightly and put his hand under his head. His elbow bent out. This gave him an air of one casually relaxing in conversation rather than one struggling with death. The pain eased out of his face. And perhaps, too, it was copied incorrectly in the past. I gasped. How could that be? The word of God? But copying still is the work of frail men. We often have to correct mistakes, and it does seem to me that gladium is very similar to gaudium. Gladium. Sword. Gaudium. Joy. I come not to send peace, but with joy. I uttered this and thought about it. It seemed much more fitting, a marvellous and truthful thing to say. Is that what I should write? Do you feel it in your heart that God is telling you to? I looked at his gaunt face, which so often looked tense and pained, and which now glowed with the last of his vigour. Yes, I said, and that is what I wrote. There came a day when our dear abbot did not rise from his pallet. He lay stiff, because any movement brought him pain. He sent for me, and I took the vigil beside him. He raised his hand and said, It will be done. I said, Yes, dear father, it will be done. He said, Not in my lifetime. But the book will be done before the world ends. He drew in a deep breath that caused his body to shake. Slowly, in an effort that caused him pain, he slid Una's ring off of his finger and held it out to me. I took it. You are going to Hibernia to found a new place for our brethren. You will not be far from Connacht. You must find Dermot, Una's husband. Tell him what happened and give him this. But don't tell him that Una is lost. He told you Deirdre is well and married. Tell him that. And that Una is with her. For she must be. I cannot bear the thought that she is not. I cannot bear the weight and grief. They are together. They must be. You will find Dermot, do you promise? I give you my vow. Our dear abbot died, and to my surprise, before that, he offered my name up to be voted on as his successor. Perhaps because so many more worthy brothers had died in the attack. It is true I had been busy assisting him. There was much to negotiate and arrange during that year, with moving to the new habitation. Abbot Connachtuck didn't live to move with us, and we buried him on Iona with lamentations. And so the abbot's office became mine, and I have great responsibilities. But because I had gradually taken over so many duties, it is not a hard transition. After we buried Connachtuck, I called a meeting of the book committee. But Reuben was dead, and now it was only Gormgal, Marcus, and myself. We needed to train up another scribe. The fight was sucked out of Gormgal. He agreed to everything, with an absent look reminding me a bit of Darek when he was so distant and ill. I expected him to oppose and fight me. But it was only my own vanity and self-importance which prompted my expectation. We rose, and Marcus left. But Gormgal asked to linger. When Marcus was gone, he sank to his knees, as one would out of respect to the abbot, to beg a favour or to receive chastisement. He closed his eyes, and didn't speak for some moments. I stood over him and placed my hands on his shoulders. Tears squeezed from his eyes. Why am I alive? he asked. I stroked his hairless pate. There must be more work for you to do. We will find comfort in the new place. I want to stay here, I want to die here. He raised his hands, and I took them in mine. There are some who are staying, but it will be a harder life with so few to do the work. I would consider it a blessing if you stayed to lead them. He held my hands tightly, and I raised him up and pulled him into my arms. He was so slight, 
So frail. I think you finally understand our purpose, he said. I didn't have faith that you would. Forgive me. There's nothing to forgive. I was slow to understand. I believed much in vanities. I'm still learning every day. So am I. We kissed each other on the cheek, and he left, walking lightly as a fawn on his knobby legs. Connachtoch had almost finished the Cairo page before he died. There was still a blank area to fill in, on the lower left side. The page already contained all manner of interlace and imagery. The row ended in a man's head, to symbolize the humanity of Christ. Angels perched on the side of the Kai, and a grapevine bordered the edge on the right. The interlace was finally done with a crow's quill, and some of the painting done with a brush barely thicker than one hair. It was up to Marcus to finish the one blank spot under the kai. He is a mysterious man, and he always takes an unusual path in this lonely life. Yet his painting surprised me. He drew two mice with the host between their teeth, watched by two cats with mice on their backs. Is it a bit of humor on this most sacred page? Does it stand for the life that continues beneath our vision while we pray? I never asked him. When I had time, I continued work on the new book. I had forgotten for a while about the lapis. Its use was no longer required. Mother Mary was already painted in royal purple instead of chaste blue while I was on my journey. But one day I ground and rinsed the lapis and made the paint. There were places in the illuminations that were blank, just little spots here and there to fill in. I took the blue and filled in these small background areas, in between various designs and letters. And I thought how God might be like that, filling in all the small spaces in our hearts, all the small spaces in our lives. I thought of our late brothers, whom I loved. Old Derek, Reuben... And Kanata, the woman Una as fierce as the desert. Their memory fills the small spaces in my mind and brings peace to my heart. I felt very calm as I painted, and I let the love of God fill me as Kanata advised, so that my love would be written into this book as his was, and as was the love of all those who were any part of our lives in the humble monastery. Tomorrow, we make the journey to Kells, where we will finish our great book and hopefully find a peaceful home for our prayers and labours. I plan to resign as abbot after we are settled. This has been the story of my part of the great book. My confession. Peace to you who read this, and may God fill your heart as he has filled mine. With the wonder of this remarkable world, and love for all who have blessed my life, on this strange journey. Part 4 Chapter 11 Coming Home Una scrubbed the floor of the hall outside the kitchen. Her hands were the colour of red tiles. When Rosa called to her, she answered without an accent, no longer tripping on the new language her voice nasal as any native's. "'Go to the market and fetch some pomegranates,' Rosa said. She handed her some coins in a little lambskin pouch. Una fastened the veil over her dark, deeply lined face and grey hair. In the beginning, Rosa hadn't let her go to the market. But now, after so long, Una had earned her trust. Rosa's hatred had turned cold, hardened, her demeanour frozen. There was no more pinching and slapping, but only a tired coldness. Rosa's skin took on a grey pallor, like a sheet of lead. Her eyes were still fierce, the flashing black the only heat in her face. Her voice was thin like an old woman's, as was Una's. Una had kept up her obedience, their secrets still kept like a cold stone in a well, like the root one can't dig out. It was unspoken, as always, only there, never changing, a hard grey thing that quieted voices whenever Una approached, that kept her apart, though no one knew the cause. She was rumoured to be some kind of witch, 
or to have committed some unknown crime. But some thought there might be an injustice to their silence towards her. But silence was kept, like a space around her, and they said to each other that Una seemed to prefer it. And after all, she seemed so proud with her erect walk and steady gaze. In the crowd, she was as anonymous as any native woman. She passed the spice stalls, where the air was thick with the smell of cumin, cinnamon, and pepper. The men who measured out the spices were all familiar to her, but they did not greet her, because though she knew them, they did not know her. The market was a place she watched closely as she went about her business, but she never conversed. She haggled like anyone else, but always settled quickly on her price. If she were quick in her task, she had time to walk and observe, and Rosa wouldn't think she had wasted time. A stray cat rubbed itself against her leg. She reached down and stroked its red fur. It blinked light eyes at her. She turned to a stall of dried fish and bought a small one and fed it to the cat. The fishmonger said, If I'd known, I wouldn't have sold it to you. Maybe you still don't know, Una muttered. Women, he said, and came out from behind his table to firmly nudge the cat away with his foot. Get off with you! The cat carried its fish and ran away. Una's eyes filled with tears, which surprised her, as she had not been prone to weeping in years. I didn't hurt at you, crazy woman, he said, returning to tend his stall. Una wiped her eyes and turned. The nut seller looked up from the book he always read between customers and crooked his finger at her. Try this! he said. His face was tender as he handed her a pistachio. The earthy taste filled her mouth. She gave him a tiny copper coin and he put a small handful in her basket. She bowed her head and moved on, crunching the nuts one by one. A feeling rose in her, almost of happiness. A light sensation that something good would happen. Maybe she would find that cat again, and take it back with her. Keep it hidden in her room and feed it scraps. Yes, she must keep an eye out for it. Una continued to the fruit stalls, where the sweet smells of lemons and dates cheered her. At the end of the stalls, where the road curved toward a fountain, a small crowd was gathering. She picked out three pomegranates, not stopping to haggle. She joined the current of the crowd, drifting toward the bend in the road. Something was happening just around it. A small drum beat rose above the sound of splashing water, where the crowd was stopped. It was a steady tapping, as if from a small drum, a child's toy. A little voice rose above it, singing. Una tried to get closer, as whatever the scene was, it was clearly enchanting to the people gathered. She squeezed ahead. There was something strange about the song, calling to her from the depths of the past. A song about a swallow flying to one's love. A song in her own language. Between the crowding shoulders, she glimpsed a four-year-old boy with his drum. The crowd was commenting with amazement, praising his bright red hair and blue eyes, his strange, unearthly beauty. Musa stood proudly next to him. Una stepped back. She let the shoulders and backs close off her view, but she could still hear the song filling a space in her chest. Emptied of breath, her heart pounding in empty space, airless. With the rushing sound of the fountain, she felt pulled under, drowning, but all was dry, so dry, and the air was above her like an apple on a high branch. She couldn't reach the air. Oh, if my love were like the swallow that flies up in the sky, then with my love I would now follow and kiss my love or I will die.
she opened her mouth, and the air rushed in at last, too much now, and she felt dizzy. The sun beat down, so hot she floated, her knees soft and collapsing. But she stood up, raised her chin, and took another glimpse at the red hair shining like a midday star. There was only to breathe, her breath, a prayer. She took three deep breaths. An idea rose in her, almost without thought. She nudged a woman next to her and pointed her finger at them. For shame, she whispered. This boy's grandmother is a slave in the house of Haran. For shame that he lets the grandmother of his darling child work as a slave. The old woman next to her bent and whispered to the girl beside her. A wave of murmuring arose. A wave that travelled like the river that had brought her here. Like a current that flowed from Canacht across the sea and emptied into this ocean of a desert. The current of her life. The whisper grew. There was pointing and tisking and the shaking of veiled heads. Someone whispered to Musa. Musa's eyes widened as he gaped at the gathered women. Una disappeared into the murmuring crowd. Her basket was light on her arm. Lightly she ran down the street. While in the kitchen she heard a man's shouts. Rosa's shrill but ultimately feeble protest. The man entered, and with bows and with awkwardness and haste, rushed Una outside into the waiting cart. They drove, winding around the white shell of the city, to a house and into a courtyard where a fountain sprayed amid vines of jasmine. Deirdre sat, looking downward at her son, playing on the mosaic tiles. Deirdre, Una said, afraid to come near. Deirdre looked up, her bright eyes shining on Una. Are you, are you a ghost? I hardly know. Deirdre jumped up and threw her arms around her. The sound of laughter and crying like a jangle of bells amid the rushing water, while the little red-haired boy beat his drum. This has been the conclusion of Kells, the Gospel of Columba. Please listen next episode when we talk with the author, Amy Kreider, about the production of this audiobook and about the upcoming publication of Kells by the University of New Orleans Press. Thanks everyone for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this journey. And if you would like to learn more about Continuous Dream, please see our webpage at www.continuousdream.com. Thanks again for listening.